Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inna alhamdulillahi na'maduhu wa nasa'inuhu wa nasaghfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyaati a'malina man yahdihi allahu falamudilla lah wa man yudlil falahadiya lah wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abdullahi wa rasooluh sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasliman kathira اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد في الاولين وصل وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد في الاخرين اللهم صل وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد في الملا الاعلى يا ارحم الراحمين uh, always we begin with the praise of allah we send our prayers and salutations of peace upon our messenger and nabi muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم we testify with firmness and conviction that none is worthy of worship but Allah, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his worshiping slave and final messenger. It's a great pleasure and an honor, alhamdulillah, to gather with my dear brothers and sisters uh, for the 57th um, Bosis Conference. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. Now, uh, alhamdulillah, one of the things that um, I wanted to begin with was uh, to kind of congratulate, mashallah, um, all of those who have come together to bring this to fruition. And I've been watching for the last 20 minutes in the background some of the wonderful initiatives and uh, videos that you guys have been compiling and sharing with each other from up and down the United Kingdom and, um, and other places. And uh, it does make the heart grow young. Oh, to be at university again, mashallah, tabarakallah. So I'm at university, but now, you know, in different roles, whether in chaplaincy or in other places. But I mean, to be given that opportunity once again to develop more and to study more and to connect more with others and to have an opportunity to focus and dedicate oneself entirely to a commitment of uh, the pursuit of knowledge, I think is something that once um, you transition from it to being an active part of society as a conveyor of the knowledge that you've gathered or putting it into practice uh, through work and other things, uh, that it is something that you will lament and wish um, that you had another opportunity to return to. And therefore, in beginning, I do want it to be something that I gave as a general advice to cherish those moments, those connections, those friendships, those uh, times of levity and, and fun, uh, the football and the wrestling classes and the sisters doing their thing, mashallah. Uh, enjoy all of the interactions you have, even the ones that are not entirely positive because they are all moments of growth as, that, as soon as, uh, as, as you and I will soon see. So I'm sharing with you via, mashallah, this uh, wonderful medium uh, uh, virtually of, of Zoom and in, in online platforms. And I would have loved, uh, subhanAllah, to be with you there in person. But as you know, the world has changed. And I don't know if it will ever return to what you and I used to um, disregard as being just the mundane. This is what it is. I can go to the lecture or not. I can drive out there or, you know, get on a train or not. But today, subhanAllah, uh, the opportunities that we have of being in physical proximity are a lot different than what they used to be four or five months ago. And uh, it is something that will take a little bit of getting used to. So continuing your uh, search of knowledge, continuing in the process of actively wanting to um, propagate and uh, not just receive, but also teach, uh, becomes something that is of incredible uh, importance into the future. The topic that has been chosen, uh, alhamdulillah, for me and delegated for me uh, for this wonderful uh, FOSIS conference is under the theme of patience and the prophets. But in particular for myself, I was asked to speak about patience in the pursuit of knowledge. And of course, this is entirely appropriate to be an introductory uh, talk for the three-day wonderful convening and conference that you guys are all gathering uh, towards. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this very first evening here uh, for you guys, uh, I, I believe it's a little bit past 7 p.m. Here it's 2.30 in the morning in Australia, mashallah, tabarakallah. And I will get tucked back into bed soon enough, uh, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala, to rise again for fajr, uh, if Allah gives us the will and, the, and the, the ability. But I wanted to speak about the importance of uh, understanding uh, terminology and uh, uh, 
how our uh, dean views particular words. And I wanted to deconstruct these two words that make up my topic sentence, which are sabr and also ilm. And in between is the word talab, search for it. But in particular, it is sabr in the talab of ilm, sabr in the pursuit of um, al ilm. Let's begin with the word ilm. Uh, the word ilm uh, in the Arabic language is a beautiful word. It's a very interesting word. And it's a word that often uh, is found in the Quran in different forms. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages you and I to be from those who worship Allah azza wa jal ala basira, who use their insight and sight to come to a fruition of knowledge. And Allah very early on says to our Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَعَلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Come to a certainty of knowledge that none is worthy of worship but Allah. And therefore to come to know God is approachable through the knowledge of oneself and their relationship with Allah. And therefore whenever you look back into the scriptures, you will find that all of the interactions of the prophets of Allah were about an acquaintance through knowledge. So Musa alayhi salam, Moses, peace and blessings be upon him, he sees the light up in the mountain of Puri Sayna. He presumes it's a fire as he's lost in the desert and it's dark and that there's people sitting around a fire. Uh, but when he approaches it, he discovers that uh, the, the flame that he believes is not a flame, but it's that a shajar al mubarakah it's this blessed tree that is enveloped in the light and it, it's a light that summons him towards Allah. And it's at that point Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, inni ana rabbuk. And therefore you see the imagery of finding light in the darkness over and over again, being a con constant, considerate uh, theme that is found in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لِيُخْرِجَكُمْ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النور, That may Allah extract you from the darknesses of the light, the numerous ways of being distracted from the singularity of the light and the purpose of Tawheed. You find Ibrahim before Moses He would look up and his eyes would turn into uh, the sky and he would look up into the stars. And Allah tells us in the Quran that as Ibrahim would debate his people, he would try to give them an acquaintance through logic and through knowledge. He hasn't yet received revelation, but he knows ما تعبدون, what is it that you worship? You know, we worship these idols with a devotion and we remain devout, devoted to them. Ibrahim السلام, he says, هل يسمعونكم إذ تدعون أو ينفعونكم أو يضرون? Do they hear you when you invoke? Has there, is there any evidence that you have of this regard? Do they uh, are able to provide any sustenance, assistance, provision for you? And he immediately dismisses it and he says, well, listen, rather than reflect on the things that your hands have worked out of the earth that you believe created you, well, why don't we look past it? And he, said, he turns their attention in debate, not in belief, but in debate of them, the art and mastery of rhetoric. And he says, Maybe these stars and these planets so far at a distance, Hada Rabbi, it's Hada Akbar. It's uh, more magnificent in its beauty, in its distance, in its structure, in its benefit, in its guidance. That when the dawn rose and the stars departed, I, I wouldn't worship anything that departs me. When Jannah alayhi layl, when the darkness overcame with the night, he saw the moon, Al Qamar. Maybe this moon, it's closer and, and nearer than the stars. When it departs with the dawn, he says, if Allah, if God doesn't lead us, we will be misguided. And the sun in return, and it sets until finally he makes this invocation for all of them. Uh, if Allah, our Lord, if the Almighty, if the unseen force in all of this world is not able to lead us and not willing to lead us astray, we will never find it. And Allah then says, I then showed unto Abraham, made the conviction of truth become apparent. So knowledge has always been a journey. It's been about discovery. It's been, been about looking that which is past you and that which is near you. MashaAllah, our brother Hussami introduced me by referring to uh, the tafsir of, uh, or in the study of Surah Al-Mulk. 
uh, that um, alhamdulillah, I do hope that you can benefit from. But in it, you will find in the very early chapter of Surah Al-Mulk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates his majesty without calling to himself. He doesn't say, Tabarakallahu alladhi biyadi mulk. Glorified is God, Allah, who in his hand is all dominion. Rather, he says, to the one who has all this dominion, that is the one you should turn to in worship. And therefore, anyone that looks out into the cosmos, to the creation of God, to the multiverse that is this um, sensible realm that we reside in, and that which is past it is far greater than it that we have not yet come to know of, not yet come to appreciate, then you one, one begins to humble themselves to the magnificence of Allah. And therefore, there is always this journey to knowledge. So all of them, inni muhajirun ila rabbi, I will make this trip and migration for my Lord. And we migrate from a variety of things, but of the greatest and first aspect of migration is from ignorance to knowledge. And that has always been the hallmark of the people of faith, past, present, and will continue to be into the future. And everything that is of faith leads us to an understanding of the magnificence of God if looked at and arrived at through the, uh, a lens of submission and of devotion to Allah. And therefore, the Quran is meant to be the final miracle and testament unto mankind. And the Quran is miraculous in its ability to provide guidance from where one did not expect it. And it could be a story that is shared in the past. It could be a linguistic tryst of the Quran. It could be uh, an evidence that is uh, documentary to human experience and existence. And all of this is, is meant to be something that leads people in their different wisdoms and different capacities and tradition to the single source of light, which is Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ard. Allah is the source of all light and enlightenment in the heavens and the earth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who provides us from that knowledge as much as we are able to gather. And therefore, in the very earliest of descriptions of the interaction that we have with Allah, is he refers to himself as Ar-Rahman, the Lord of all mercy, the most compassionate, the gracious, the beneficent, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allam al-Quran. What is his greatest expression of mercy? Is that he taught to us the Quran. He spoke to us these words of the scripture. Khalaq al-insan. Because he's the one who created mankind. He's the one who knows what they need to adjust their life with. So he has taught the Quran to those who we have created from man. Khalaq al-insan. Allamahu al-bayan. He's the one who allowed and taught the ability to express and to, uh, to illuminate to others through words and the disclaimer of knowledge. And this word bayan is very significant. It's not allamahu al qira'a, taught him to read, or allamahu, uh, you know, al kitaba, the ability to write. No, it's al bayan, the ability to describe, the ability to have um, uh, a nomenclature and assessment. And that's why you see of the first descriptions of Adam, wa allama Adam al asma kullaha. Allah taught Adam the name of all things, the descriptors of all things. And when you look at any field of study that you are involved in at the moment in your academic life, you will see that your studies will revolve around what? Naming and places and defining, but it's, it's, it's only through the definition and description that you can become more detailed in your expression and most importantly in conveyance onto others. So we have descriptions for the elements in chemistry. We have description for the summation of formulations in, uh, you know, quadratic expressions and other, um, uh, uh, you know, ciphers that we study. Everything is meant to be described towards others. And it's that form of language that is what makes us different to the language that is inhabited and used and habitual with other creatures that walk the earth, who Allah refers to in the Quran as ummun amthalukum. They are nations unto themselves, just like you are a nation. And Allah quotes to us the different discussions that uh, animals have um, amongst themselves. And in Surah An-Naml, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَقَالَتْ نَمْلَةً Allah quotes an ant. And he says, the ant spoke up in its own capacity. 
through its chemical signatures or through its irritation of soil that is around it or through you know whatever means that ant conveyed its 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 knowledge towards others and it's through sound and scent and chemi uh, chemistry that it spoke to its people and that there was one organized spokesperson there was one who had domination over others the queen ant was the one who was representative of the rest of the group who they would follow its instructions waqalat namla ya ayyuhan naml dkhulu masa enter into your homes hide under the ground la yahtimannakum sulayman wa junudu solomon and his troop and it identifies the the others it identifies sulayman it identifies the nature of those who are with him and describes them with uh that they are troops and therefore you see that the ability to describe is something that is quite significant and that became the central separation between mankind and the anima kingdoms around us that we were able to go past just simply saying watch out or there's danger to be able to qualify it and to describe it and to assess it and to build knowledge systems that can then be practiced and shared with other people at a distance from us so knowledge is something that is important al imam al ghazali and i would like to leave you with this quote as we describe knowledge he says al ilm knowledge is meant to be comprehensive it's meant to be multidisciplinary and the one who is scholarly and al alim man alima an kulli shay shay the one who is an erudite a scholar of knowledge a person who is should be and meant to be multidimensional when you look in our faith tradition some of the great luminaries that you and I continue to respect are people like al imam al nawawi or al ghazali so when al ghazali wanted to refute um you know the uh, the philosophical ramblings of those in his time and he wanted to produce a manual uh on how to refute to have with the uh 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 you know he wanted to produce a document against those who were now translating in a translated greek and latin documents he didn't go towards the translations no he went and studied latin and he mastered latin so that he could read it in its own context and its own knowledge and that's what he means al alim man alima an kulli shay shay a scholar one of knowledge is the one who acquires information and knowledge we will separate between the two words information and knowledge shortly is the one who gathers knowledge about every subject at least a part at least a section uh that the one who is scholarly as much as he is interested in the correct qira'a and the pronunciation and the rules of tajweed is also interested in logic is also interested in mantiq um is also interested in uh, uh astronomy is interested in elementary at the very least mathematics and geometry and the principles of um of design that a person of knowledge is not just simply limited to the esoteric but is also material in their study al imam al nawawi was a physician before he was a muhaddith right it was gathered together so think of of knowledge in that sense and ta'lama an kulli shay shay you gather knowledge about all things so that you're not absent entirely from any one branch of knowledge wa an ta'lama an shay kulli shay and it's that you then focus on one element of knowledge or more that you become so specialized in because of your great interest and desire to acquire it and learn it that it becomes something central to your specialization and study and then you can you know be a master of medicine or you can be a person who has mastered and that's where you get the word master and uh, a doctorate in a particular aspect of branches of knowledge what is the difference between information and knowledge because at times many people uh, we conflate them and there is a, a direct separation point between information and knowledge so information is something that is readily available so on the internet i can now access information uh, about the constitution um and 
uh, I can look through the Constitution of Australia. Now, of course, that would not allow me to interpret that. Uh, my wife, who's uh, a solicitor, she has training in the practice and the application of the information found in the Constitution and in the bylaws and in different regulations that I can read about as information, but I don't have the ability to act upon and to understand in a way that can be mechanized for production. And therefore, uh, information is a wonderful thing. It's a telephone book, it's the internet, it's wiki, it's, uh, you know, there's lots of information. But it's actualization, it's putting into practice, it's placing it in the right capacity, the hikma of information, the wisdom of how information is relevant and where it fits in with other bits and pieces of information is what we refer to as ilm, the knowledge that is meant to be gathered from information and sources. So patience then becomes a really important pretext to knowledge. And we're working backwards. We said that knowledge is important, but we have to pursue it. And the word talab is, and the pursuit of knowledge is not ever meant to be uh, momentary. It's meant to be comprehensive and consistent and a lifelong journey. And therefore the ulama of the past, they would say ma'al mahvara ila al-maqvara, holding my um, ink, uh, 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 you know, my pen from, the point I've learned to read and write and learn to you know, take down notes until I'm buried and entombed in my grave, I will always be attached to that pursuit of knowledge. And some of the great ulama of uh, you know, hadith, we have these stories that they're on their deathbed and they are told of a new hadith and, and before they, you know, they're passing by hours or so, they were still noting it, writing it down. Such were the likes of al-Imam Yahya ibn Ma'in and Ahmad ibn Hanbal and those great luminaries. But you find also that in our contemporary times, the pursuit of knowledge becomes sacred, as it was at the time of the Prophet and before him and into our time and later than us, that there was always meant to be a sacredness. And I use knowledge in its most comprehensive capacity. So yes, my dear brother and sister, if your intent is virtuous, if in your heart you have a purpose-driven goal that you want to learn um, you know, cryptography or you want to learn uh, biology or good um, uh, ling uh, you know, linguistic uh, uh, processes, whatever it is your field of study, and you've set in your heart that this is, oh Allah, I want to gather this knowledge to be a conveyance and a conveyor towards others, to earn from it a halal rizq that will turn me away from the haram, then each and every step of the way, that pursuit, that talab, is an act of ibadah, is an act of worship. And therefore, the Prophet ﷺ would speak so much to us about the virtue of knowledge and then the virtue of conveying it and teaching it. Some people, sadly, they got this impression uh, erroneously that this knowledge was limited just to the scriptural knowledge or the knowledge of the Qur'an or the conveyance of hadith. But in fact, most of the ulama, they say it extends far beyond that into anything that leads a person to that which is of value to themselves and society and other people in their time and perhaps out of it. And that's even in the abstract and that's in their writings and you know in many different capacities. And that's important for us to clarify. So therefore the word talab becomes important in the pursuit of knowledge that is an unending pursuit. It is a continuation of life. And that becomes the structure that you always have in whatever professional environment that you will be in. There will always be the upkeep and the maint maintenance of the knowledge you possess. Bismillah. So therefore, there is the need of patience. And Imam Shafi'i, in some of his famous poetry in his Diwan, he would say, how foolish is a person who seeks to gather knowledge when there is no effort and there is um, no uh, hard work that is put in on their part. And no one will memorize the Quran, no one will become skilled in physics, no one will uh, uh, become uh, a competent medical doctor or uh, uh, you know, uh, a designer or an engineer 
without investing themselves completely into the project and spending hours into the night. And that just is the reality of life. And any person who wants to excel must put in effort. And that's very much a part of tawakkul and a form of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the virtue of knowledge. So let's turn our attention, therefore, to that which gives us the ability to move forward and to attain that knowledge, which is the word sabr, patience. I hate that word patience, right? It's, um, it's, it's one of those bland vanilla words. Uh, the real you know, word that I would, would rather um, translate the word sabr with is resilience or tenacity or perseverance. Uh, endurance or persistence. All of those are different words. Uh, for me, my favorite, uh, and they come in different contexts, would be resilience as the overwhelming, re uh, enduring resilience is the overwhelming uh, image that you should have as it relates to sub. It is to have a, an unending desire to go forward and to go past where I did yesterday, and to go past where others are able to go in my ability. Now, notice that within our structure as Muslims, that there are two words that combine together that uplift Iman. Two words are sabr and shukr, resilience and thankfulness. Resilience and patience and endurance in that which befalls us that we're not happy with. And shukr is in that which we are happy with and we are thankful for. But they also work inversely. Shukr for the things that we weren't able to attain and to be thankful for not attaining something that we wanted because ultimately we know that that is what is best for us in store with Allah. And sabr in that which is written for us to perform that requires for us to have a greater resilience in, in, it's the, in the conveyance of good deeds uh, and so on. And that will become clear as we move forward inshallah. So if you were to consider these two important statements, sabr and shuk, that they are the two uh, branches of faith that uh, uplift our faith. And this comes from different imagery that Imam ibn al-Qayyim, he shares. He speaks about it, of course, in terms of taqwa and other ways. But ultimately, it funnels down into the two parts of our faithfulness that uplift our iman, is that we're able to be sabr, and Shakir, a person of Ni'm al Abd, to be a person who is righteous with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, conveying, uh, accepting, and steadfast and enduring in all, in all determinations, and thankful for Shakir and Umi, for all of the Ni'mah that has been bestowed upon us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, uh, let us begin to kind of understand the context of sabr as it relates to how Allah has conveyed it to us in the scripture in the Quran. Sabara has many different words and different um, ways and circumstances that it's used in the Quran. And it's meant to be something that sabr is an internal process that shows externally. So it is something that I have in my heart that allows my body to react in certain ways. So it's very much a personal process within me, but it's also meant to influence the collective and the community that is around me. So think of it as being something where I'm persistent in the right course of action, persistent in the pursuit of the right things, persistent whether in, in uh, moments of comfort and levity or in moments of sorrow and, 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 and uh, 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 adversity, that in all adverse and in all uh, conditions, that internally and externally, personally and for the collective betterment, I have a dedicated focus towards that which is pleasing to Allah. So Allah speaks to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu in particular, and he says, وَاصْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُو الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ The first lesson that you need, Ya Muhammad, is that you are needing to be determined and resilient as those of great uh, uh, of Ulul Azm, those who had the greatest covenant with me were patient before you. So look to how Moses was patient with his people when they turned away from the truth. Look at how patient Moses was as he faced off towards Pharaoh, as they were cornered at the, uh, at the sea and I parted it for them eventually. 
that Moses had a resilience in his belief in me. He says, Kalla inna ma'ya Rabbi sayahdeen. My Lord will never let me down. He will guide me to where we need to go and what we need to do. The Quran speaks uh, 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 to, to us, not just towards the Prophet ﷺ, but to a nation that is following the tradition of the Prophet. So the Quran, Allah promises us through it, that those who face difficulty and yet remain persistent in the right path, that they receive double the reward. That the Quran, it emphasizes that this jihad and this musabara are intertwined. That for me to struggle and strive for the pursuit of justice for myself, for my community, for my country, for my people, for my faith, for my, uh, you know, for my family, that this level of commitment to struggle for a, a realization of good, that this eternally is a concept of sub. And whenever this word is mentioned, especially in the context of the battle of Uhud, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says um, to the Prophet and the Sahaba as uh, in the battle of Uhud as they were uh, facing the onslaught of the overwhelming force of, of the people of Quraysh. Um, uh, Did you think that you would just walk into paradise and Allah would not first make it known through these circumstances that you're facing now those who are resilient in their struggle and those who will remain resilient thereafter, those who will have this patience? You know, uh, uh, those who came before you were determined through patience and they showed their valor in that. And therefore you can translate the word sabr in this context as tenacity and endurance and going through hardship to come out stronger and more resilient on the other side. Sometimes also the word sabr is utilized in the Quran to convey the continuation of worship, in particular salat. Istainu bisabri wa salat. Notice how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says whenever any adversity ap uh, approaches us, I command you to patience and then prayer. And the great Imams, when they speak about this ayah, you know, most people you would say, Oh, yeah, Allah, something has happened. Your first thing is to pray towards Allah. Yeah, Allah. Oh, Allah, make it easy, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, actually begin with patience, meaning in your heart. Be willing to endure this, be willing to accept, be willing to have rida, be willing to look past this difficulty and recognize the good that you've had. That with your sabr, you will find your resilience through your shukr, through your thankfulness for the other things that I haven't removed from you, haven't tested you in, haven't debilitated you by. That you are thankful to me all throughout. And therefore, uh, as you continue with your pursuit of knowledge, Know that there will be things that you will have as an immense benefit in your, in your capacity to receive that will not be uh, you know, easy for you. But you know that you are, will be thankful for it through it and at the end of it by the virtue and the bounty of Allah. And you know, the ulama, when they speak about sabr, they speak about it as being synonymous with acts of worship like prayer. Uh, sabr, the, the month of patience, the month of resilience and persistence, which is fasting and so on. All of these have this context. So in my final uh, few minutes with you, I wanted to end with mechanizing displays of patience towards the pursuit of knowledge. So when I say sabr, I don't want it to be an abstract theme. I want it to be very much practical for you. So the very first thought that I say to you about how to use sabr in your relationship with Allah towards the pursuit of knowledge is by having sabr in your intention. That you make a dedication in your intent, in your purposeful goal. The word intention is kind of fuzzy, but niya is that you have a purpose-driven goal. That this is what I want and this is what I need to achieve it. This is how I'm going to achieve this material success, this academic success, that I must set a path and a course towards it that I know will require an endurance over length of time. So pressure over time is very much an, a systematic formula for how we develop patience. Number two is know that leaders and those who will become industry leaders in whatever industry are those who demonstrated patience. And this is verbatim from the Quran. Allah describes the children of Israel, Bani Israel, who are an example to our community, 
وجعلنا منهم من سورة السجدة وجعلنا منهم أئمة يهدون بأمرنا لما صبروا وكانوا بآياتنا يوقنون I made from amongst the lineage of Bani Israel imams, luminaries of enlightenment, luminaries to be followed, luminaries of leadership for themselves and the communities that surround them and into the ages when they demonstrated patience. And because of their patience, it showed that they had yaqeen, certain knowledge in the signs that we had sent to them by my leave and by my will. All of those are things that are important. Third, I say to you that as a part of sabr, you must know that it requires more patience to do what is necessary in piety rather than to simply eliminate that which is sinful. As-sabru ala al-ma'mur, to be patient in what Allah commanded us to do of good, is going to be a more difficult, long-term um, uh, re uh, requiring resilience and endurance as a test for us than it is to simply abstain from haram. It'll be much easier for you to say, I'm not going to ever drink uh, alcohol or, be, uh, or get intoxicated That'll be much easier challenge for you in life to abstain from that haram than it will be for you to be consistent with your fajr prayer each and every morning for the rest of your life. Because that is the way you prove that you are thankful to Allah, which is attached in concept to sabr. And so keep that uh, spirit alive. Um, know that innama yuwafa sabiruna ajrahum bi ghayri hisab, that the reward for patience with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is limitless and there is no end to it. So two people could do the same act. One of them had to demonstrate more patience than the other due to the circumstances of their life. Both of them eventually graduate with a degree. For one of them, it is a degree in the dunya but leads them to Jannah because of the patience they demonstrated in it. For another, it's a degree in the dunya and they have a job because of it. And therefore you can mechanize your thought and your intent to lead you to great, great heights with Allah. And it is a limitless reward, un unlike the other acts of worship. Finally, the act of sabr is an act of the heart, but it is a demonstration of the body. So you cannot be a person who says, I have sabr in my heart, but you are complaining about Allah. The complaint is to Allah, and the heart finds ease in its accepting of the calamity at the moment it's befalling. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows you all to complete your degrees and your studies with patience and resilience and endurance, that Allah allows you to simultaneously put in a consistent effort in the pursuit of our spiritual traditional knowledge, the knowledge of Allah and the acquaintance of the inner dynamics of our relationship with Him and the prayer and the salah, that you have a gain, a, a trust for knowledge, and that you become a conduit of good, filling the world with light and happiness towards others and releasing the burden from those who have been burdened with it. And I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect you and honors you and uplift you, that Allah makes easy your journey and that Allah makes um, uh, your path to knowledge one of virtue and of ease towards that which is khayr in this dunya and akhirah. وصل اللهم وسلم وزد وبارك على سيدنا وحبيبنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك كونوا مع الصابرين be from those and of those and with those of patience may Allah make you and I of them والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته سبحان الله سبحان الله سبحانه we just have a Jazakallah um, Khair for that amazing talk, Alhamdulillah. There was so many, just a loads of list of benefits that I wrote. And obviously the ayah they mentioned, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةَ يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْنِنَا لَمَّا صَبَرُوا سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ And we made from among them leaders guided by our command when, when they were patient. وَكَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يُوْقِنُونَ And um, when they were certain, uh, had yaqeen of our science بِأَمْنِنَا سُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ uh, There were, um, uh, some questions that we have some from from the attendees alhamdulillah that we are hoping you could answer inshallah ta'ala sure. that's okay alhamdulillah jazakallah khair alhamdulillah um so we'll go with the questions that are have been liked the most by our attendees first question is uh that is most liked is 
how can we best balance our want to acquire Islamic knowledge with our specialization in secular knowledge acquisition? Well, what I would say to that is, um, you know, subhanAllah, there will be certain things that you have to give up. And there's nothing gained in life without giving up something in its place. So, uh, subhanAllah, I always wanted to go to Medina University, actually. But uh, it was, you know, my father and mother's advice to me and, and other people. They said, yeah, yeah, we'd rather you stay here. And, you know, I, I attended the University of Toronto. And in the summer months, I would then dedicate it to acquiring what I could of the, the knowledge of the Quran or of um, uh, that I was beginning to memorize and, and trying to retain. And, you know, um, I was told by my teachers that if you want to memorize the Quran, you actually have to forget it first. You have to have that worry. It's always going to slip from you. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ would say, Ashaddu shay'an tafalluta. The Quran is the thing that runs away from you. It's quicker than a camel that will leave you in the desert. It'll just take off. So you want to hold on to it, which means that you have to be resilient and consistent. So if that is a true wish in your heart, you will make it happen. You will have, you know, a 20-minute session, a 30-minute session that you dedicate to knowledge each and every day. And it's not by attaining it in its entirety in one, in one day or in one year or even in one decade. Um, and I'll paraphrase it in the knowledge of the Quran, which is most important to you. That if you really, uh, for every uh, Muslim, their niyyah in their heart is to master the Qur'an, to memorize the Qur'an. And you might sit there and say, how am I ever, I'll never memorize the Qur'an. Well, there's so many other things you've memorized, but you learn them over the years. And nobody should ever tell you that the Qur'an should be learned in, you know, two years in madrasa or in duksi or whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, we've had this image that you go to the Majid and you memorize the Quran and it's just little kids that do it. And if you didn't know it, you didn't know it. And if, if you weren't a hafiz by your teens, you're just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But I want to know that the Prophet ﷺ learned the Quran over 23 years. And the Prophet ﷺ finished the Quran in his 60s, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the Quran wasn't meant just for young people to be, oh, it's, if you don't get it when you're young, it'll never stay in your heart. No, that's not the reality. So Umar ibn Khattab and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and these great Sahaba, they didn't get the Qur'an when they were teens and young people, right? So master the Qur'an and every day put in your heart one ayah. Put in your heart one verse every day. And if you don't finish by the end of your life, may Allah give you and I a long life, you had that intent to master it. So dedicate that as being a part and parcel of your framework of life. That is how you will find balance between the two. I will never say to you, give up one over the other. And I will say to you, definitely make your scholastic and academic achievements a priority for a certain period of time, these four years, eight years of your degree or medicine or whatever it is. But never, ever, ever give up the tradition and the pursuit of knowledge thereafter as a lifelong ambition. <laughs> Uh, the next question it was um, with regards to understanding the Quran, how great is the difference between reading an English translation as compared to understanding it in Arabic? Uh, so let me tell you something as an Arab. Uh, Arabic people don't understand the Quran. That's why we have something called tafsir, right? So, uh, you know, just walk up to one of your Arabic brothers, Arabic sisters today and say, Wal'adiyati dabha, falmuriyati qadha, falmughirati zubha. You say, Wallahi ya'ni. Yani I'm not uh, let me let me check about what Ibn Kathir said. Right? Uh, so the very mechanism that you refer to as an English translation is Ibn Kathir, which is an Arabic translation for Arabs. Because the Quran is in a newspaper, right? It's got words in it that are ambiguous. It was not meant to be entirely self-evident. So do not let the shaitan detract you from learning to pronounce and to read the Qur'an and to master and memorize it in its entirety, even if you don't understand it. Because the person who's standing next to you who could be an Arab who's memorized it, doesn't understand it, maybe they understand the word hadha, or they understand, you know, ilm, or, but those are vocabulary things that are approximation. But their context in the Sharia is something that requires a pursuit of knowledge, which will be an extension that you do. So don't let that become a deterrent from you from mastering the reading, recitation, tajweed, and, and, and preferring to 
fragrant your tongue with its reading each and every day. Thank you. I did that. Uh, next, next last question is, uh, how do you know which aspect of Islam we should spend more time on? For example, if we want to study Sira or Tafsir, but do not know Tajweed, then how do we prioritize? Uh, how do we know which aspect is more important? Uh, and that's why it's really important to kind of develop a relationship with somebody who is learned. Uh, for our sisters, mashallah, there are great opportunities to uh, receive knowledge from, uh, mashallah, some sisters, ustazas and, and doctors who have, you know, uh, attained great, great height. And I wanted to begin with the sisters because I think sisters usually feel that they're left out or it's a male-dominated thing. No, alhamdulillah, there's a lot of places now uh, where you can find you know, qualified um, uh, sisters in the English language to be able to provide you the ilm that is bidarura, knowledge that is by an essential means you must have. So knowledge that mechanizes your worship in a more meaningful way. And I don't mean just the spiritual stuff, but I mean like the in-depth stuff that, that you're seeking. So find an ustaz, find an ustaza. You need someone to mentor you and it shouldn't be left up to you alone to say, hmm, I wonder what I'm going to study uh, next. So there, there is that desire for you to um, uplift yourself. And in, if you don't have somebody in your locality, uh, that is a place that, and that is something that you might want, mashallah, in your FOSIS and uh, uh, in your ISOCs and in your MSAs, if, if other people across the world are listening uh, eventually, that you want this to be something that you can provide to your students. So each and every... I saw it has so many wonderful gems, so many hidden diamonds uh, that are there. Experts in Quran, experts in Qira'a, uh, you know, people who are studying the deen, but who are not famous or not on a platform and not being invited for Zoom calls. But they are people who exist in your community who can teach you Surat Al-Mulk in a way that will not leave your heart, who will give you an inner dimension and do a guided reading with you of a particular chapter. Until you can transition to more formal studies, don't overlook those who could be of great benefit to your heart and to your religious knowledge. I would always prefer to you to become acquainted with Allah through the Quran, through the knowledge of the Quran. And uh, I would not say to you, oh, you know, uh, leave the Quran until you learn uh, something else. The Quran becomes the primary focus, but how you mechanize the Quran is through the knowledge of its practice and that's where fiqh comes in and, and that will be of great benefit to you inshallah inshallah um, next question was okay um, okay there is so much information that we can gain knowledge from it if uh, if it was difficult to retain all okay, there's so much information that we gain from knowledge if it feels difficult to retain it all how do you recommend retaining the knowledge as we gain it um, so if you were to ask any person who's memorized the Quran, how do you keep it in your mind? And you say, I read it. I just keep, you know, I just read it. So I end and then I read it again. And then, and then what do you do? Well, I, I start again. And then what do you do? And then I start again. So in fact, you know, the ulama, uh, especially for the Quran, for its knowledge, and each and every one of us who's listening and myself speaking, there's a section of the Quran that we used to know really well, say a month ago, that today we don't know as well as we do. And it takes, you know, to go back to it. So there, there's probably a surah that you used to know when you were younger, that if I was to tell you right now, hey, can you read for me, uh, shamsu kuwirat, you'd be like, kuwirat, uh, yeah, I know that surah, well, I have known it, Sheikh. I've known it all my life, but, you know, I, I wouldn't lead myself or other people in prayer. Why? Because it's not visited as often. So, uh, you know, the the our teachers, they would say, khamsa la tansa. Five juz a day, you don't forget it. Which is, you know, a uh, hundred pages of the Quran. So every week you would finish it. And that was kind of seen as a standard. Sometimes it's three juz, sometimes it's two juz to become acquainted. And it's the same thing with revising your knowledge. It's the same thing with revising a chapter such as the chapter of sabr, or the chapter of ilm. So before, you know, you, I would give this talk, I would go back and review some of the books, the Targhib or Targhib or this or that, and I would uh, refresh my mind of what it is are some of the things that I want to share with you. So the first knowledge is rehearsal. And that's why Jibreel would descend every year in Ramadan to rehearse 
with the Prophet ﷺ, the Quran, and so on. Uh, so always return and always keep reading and always become familiar. Uh, the second thing that I will say, and it's the reason the Prophet says, anni, convey to others, because the best way to retain knowledge is to teach it. You, uh, and that's, you know, that, that's from um, a, a practical um, uh, example that social uh, psychologists and educationists will tell you that if you want your students to retain knowledge that you're sharing with them, it's not by you lecturing up at a whiteboard or at a blackboard, it's by you getting them to sit with each other and to dissect something that they explain to each other after studying. So everybody gets a little piece of knowledge and they sit and collaborate and teach it to each other. That's where the knowledge will become more foundational. Inshallah ta'ala, we will end it there as we are out of time. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, alhamdulillah. That was an honor. Uh, it was an honor having you and, uh, and hosting and introducing you alhamdulillah and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts it from us all and allows us to implement that which uh, that which the Sheikh has mentioned in, ter in terms of especially the characteristics of a sabr and, and the shukr and how the these are two branches of faith which will help us build and increase our iman and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, uh, makes, this, makes this a means of our entry into Jannah to those and puts it on our scales of good deeds on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah when we stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Is there anything else you, you, you would like to say before we conclude? And just assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and uh, keep me in your dua and I will keep you in mind. Wa salli lahumma wa sallim wa zid wa barik ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.